Jason Calvert, and this, is The History Tellers. Welcome to our last segment in our series about colonial society on the eve of revolution. In this series we have been looking at the people and events that made the 13 separate colonies into one group of Americans. We have to ask ourselves, why did some British colonies strike for independence, while others did not? That answer can be found, in part, by looking at the distinctive social, economic, and political structures of the 13 colonies, and in the halting, gradual appearance of a recognizably American way of life. Leading off tonight is Gabrielle Calvert with an in-depth look at the first schools and colleges established in the colonies. A time-honored English idea regarded education as a blessing reserved for the aristocratic few, not for the unwashed many. It was widely believed that education should be for leadership, not citizenship, and primarily for males. Only slowly and painfully did the colonists break the chains of these ancient restrictions. Puritan New England, largely for religious reasons, was more zealously interested in education than any other section. Dominated by the Congregational Church, it stressed the need for Bible reading by the individual worshiper. The primary goal of the clergy was to make good Christians rather than good citizens. A more secular approach was evident late in the 18th century, when some children were warned in the following verse He who near learns his ABC. Forever will a blockhead be. But he who learns his letters fair shall have a coach to take the air. Education, principally for boys, flourished almost from the outset in New England. This densely populated region boasted an impressive number of graduates from the English universities, especially Cambridge, the intellectual center of England's Puritanism. New Englanders, at a relatively early date, established primary and secondary schools, which varied widely in the quality of instruction and in the length of time that their doors remained open each year. Back-straining farm labor drained much of a youth's time and energy. Fairly adequate elementary schools were also hammering knowledge into the heads of reluctant scholars in the middle colonies and in the south, some of these institutions were tax-supported, others were privately operated. The south, with its white and black population diffused over wide areas, was severely handicapped by logistics in attempting to establish an effective school system. Wealthy families leaned heavily on private tutors. The general atmosphere in the colonial schools and colleges continued grim and gloomy. Most of the emphasis was placed on religion and on the classical languages, Latin and Greek. The focus was not on experiment and reason, but on doctrine and dogma. The age was one of orthodoxy, and independence of thinking was discouraged. Discipline was quite severe, with many a mischievous child being sadistically birched with a switch cut from a birch tree. Sometimes punishment was inflicted by indentured servant teachers, who could themselves be whipped for their failures as workers and who therefore were not inclined to spare the rod. College education was regarded at least at first in New England as more important than instruction in the ABCs. Churches would wither if a new crop of ministers was not trained to lead the spiritual flocks. Many well-to-do families, especially in the South, sent their boys abroad to English institutions. For purposes of convenience and economy, nine local colleges were established during the colonial era. Student enrollments were small, numbering about 200 boys at the most, and at one time a few lads as young as 11 were admitted to Harvard. Instruction was poor by present-day standards. The curriculum was still heavily loaded with theology and the dead languages, although by 1750 there was a distinct trend toward live languages and other modern subjects. A significant contribution was made by Benjamin Franklin, who played a major role in launching what became the University of Pennsylvania, the first American college free from denominational control. For the History Tellers, I'm Gabrielle Calvert. When it came to art and culture, colonial Americans were still enthralled to European tastes, especially British. The simplicity of pioneering life had not yet bred many American patrons of the arts. One aspiring painter, John Trumbull of Connecticut, was discouraged in his youth by his father's chilling remark, Connecticut is not Athens. Like so many of his talented artistic contemporaries, Trumbull was forced to travel to London to pursue his ambitions. Charles Wilson Peale, best known for his portraits of George Washington, ran a museum, stuffed birds, and practiced dentistry. Gifted Benjamin West and precocious John Singleton Copley succeeded in their ambition to become famous painters, but like Trumbull they had to go to England to complete their training. Only abroad could they find subjects who had the leisure to sit for their portraits and the money to pay handsomely for them. Copley was regarded as a loyalist during the Revolutionary War, and West, a close friend of George III and official court painter, 
was buried in London St. Paul's Cathedral. Architecture was largely imported from the Old World and modified to meet the peculiar climatic and religious conditions of the New World. Even the lowly log cabin was apparently borrowed from Sweden. The red brick Georgian style, so common in the pre-revolutionary decades, was introduced about 1720 and is best exemplified by the beauty of now-restored Williamsburg, Virginia. Colonial literature, like art, was generally undistinguished, and for much the same reasons. One noteworthy exception was the poet Phyllis Wheatley, sold into slavery at age seven or eight she was brought to Boston and taught how to read and write. Although she was never formally educated, her master's family encouraged her talent in poetry. A very rare occurrence on those days. The publication of her book in 1773, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious, and Moral, brought her fame both in England and the American colonies. She was emancipated shortly after the publication of her book and married in 1778. Sadly, two of her children died as infants and after her husband was imprisoned for debt in 1784, Wheatley fell into poverty and died of illness. Versatile Benjamin Franklin, often called the first civilized American, also shown as a literary light. Although his autobiography is now a classic, he was best known to his contemporaries for Poor Richard's Almanac, which he edited from 1732 to 1758. This famous publication, containing many pithy sayings called from the thinkers of the ages, emphasized such homespun virtues as thrift, industry, morality, and common sense. Examples are what maintains one vice would bring up two children, plow deep while sluggards sleep, honesty is the best policy, and fish and visitors stink in three days. Poor Richards was well known in Europe and was more widely read in America than anything except the Bible. As a teacher of both old and young, Franklin had an incalculable influence in shaping the American character. Science, rising above the shackles of superstition, was making some progress, though lagging behind the old world. A few botanists, mathematicians, and astronomers had won some repute, but Benjamin Franklin was perhaps the only first-ranked scientist produced in the American colonies. Franklin's spectacular but dangerous experiments, including the famous kite-flying episode proving that lightning was a form of electricity, won him numerous honors in Europe. But his mind also had a practical turn, and among his numerous inventions were bifocal spectacles and the highly efficient Franklin stove. His lightning rod, not surprisingly, was condemned by some stodgy clergyman who felt it was presuming on God by attempting to control the artillery of the heavens. The ability to express opinions, ideas, relate stories and share knowledge would be the single galvanizing factor that set the colonies apart from England. The printing press, would forever alter the culture of the colonies and shape the future United States. Reporting tonight on this magnificent invention and its impact on colonial society is Jalen McMurrin. Stump-grubbing Americans were generally too poor to buy quantities of books and too busy to read them. A South Carolina merchant in 1744 advertised the arrival of a shipment of printed books, pictures, maps, and pickles. A few private libraries of fair size could be found, especially among the clergy. The Bird family of Virginia enjoyed perhaps the largest collection in the colonies, consisting of about 4,000 volumes. Bustling Benjamin Franklin established in Philadelphia the first privately supported circulating library in America, and by 1776 there were about 50 public libraries and collections supported by subscription. Hand-operated printing presses cranked out pamphlets, leaflets, and journals. On the eve of the Revolution, there were about 40 colonial newspapers, chiefly weeklies that consisted of a single large sheet folded once. Columns ran heavily to somber essays, frequently signed with such pseudonyms as Cicero, Philosophicus, and Pro Bono Publico. The news often lagged many weeks behind the event, especially in the case of overseas happenings, in which the colonists were deeply interested. Newspapers proved to be a powerful agency for airing colonial grievances and rallying opposition to British control. A celebrated legal case, in 1734–1735, involved John Peter Zenger, a newspaper printer. Significantly, the case arose in New York, reflecting the tumultuous give and take of politics in the Middle Colonies, where so many different ethnic groups jostled against one another. Zenger's newspaper had assailed the corrupt royal governor. Charged with seditious libel, the accused was hauled into court, where he was defended by a former indentured servant, now a distinguished Philadelphia lawyer, Andrew Hamilton. Zenger argued that he had printed the truth, but the bewigged royal chief justice instructed the jury not to consider the truth or falsity of Zenger's statements. The mere fact of printing, irrespective of the truth, was enough to convict. <laughs> 
Hamilton countered that the very liberty of both exposing and opposing arbitrary power was at stake. Swayed by his eloquence, the jurors defied the bewigged judges and daringly returned a verdict of not guilty. Cheers burst from the spectators. The Zenger decision was a banner achievement for freedom of the press and for the health of democracy. It pointed the way to the kind of open public discussion required by the diverse society that colonial New York already was, and that all America was to become. Although contrary to existing law and not immediately accepted by other judges and juries, in time it helped establish the doctrine that true statements about public officials could not be prosecuted as libel. Newspapers were thus eventually free to print responsible criticisms of powerful officials, though full freedom of the press was unknown during the pre-revolutionary era. For the History Tellers, I'm Jalen McMurrin. American colonists may have been backward in natural or physical science, but they were making noteworthy contributions to political science. The 13 colonial governments took a variety of forms. By 1775, eight of the colonies had royal governors, who were appointed by the king. Three colonies, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, were under proprietors who themselves chose the governors. And two, Connecticut and Rhode Island elected their own governors under self-governing charters. Practically every colony utilized a two-house legislative body. The upper house, or council, was normally appointed by the crown in the royal colonies and by the proprietor in the proprietary colonies. It was chosen by the voters in the self-governing colonies. The lower house, as the popular branch, was elected by the people, or rather by those who owned enough property to qualify as voters. In several of the colonies, the backcountry elements were seriously underrepresented, and they hated the ruling colonial clique perhaps more than they did kingly authority. Legislatures, in which the people enjoyed direct representation, voted such taxes as they chose for the necessary expenses of colonial government. Self-taxation through representation was a precious privilege that Americans had come to cherish above most others. Governors appointed by the king were generally able men, sometimes outstanding figures. Some, unfortunately, were incompetent or corrupt broken down politicians badly in need of jobs. The worst of the group was probably impoverished Lord Cornbury, first cousin of Queen Anne, who was made governor of New York and New Jersey in 1702. He proved to be a drunkard, a spendthrift, a grafter, an embezzler, a religious bigot, and a vain fool, who was accused probably inaccurately of dressing like a woman. Even the best appointees had trouble with the colonial legislatures basically because the royal governor embodied a bothersome transatlantic authority some 3,000 miles away. The colonial assemblies found various ways to assert their authority and independence. Some of them employed the trick of withholding the governor's salary unless he yielded to their wishes. He was normally in need of money, otherwise he would not have come to this god-forsaken country, so the power of the purse usually forced him to terms. But one governor of North Carolina died with his salary 11 years in arrears. The London government in leaving the colonial governor to the tender mercies of the legislature, was guilty of poor administration. In the interests of simple efficiency, the British authorities should have arranged to pay him from independent sources. As events turned out, control over the purse by the colonial legislatures led to prolonged bickering, which proved to be one of the persistent irritants that generated a spirit of revolt. Administration at the local level was also varied. County government remained the rule in the plantation south, town meeting government predominated in New England and a modification of the two developed in the middle colonies. In the town meeting, with its open discussion and open voting, direct democracy functioned at its best. In this unrivaled cradle of self-government, Americans learned to cherish their privileges and exercise their duties as citizens of the New World Commonwealths. Yet the ballot was by no means a birthright. Religious or property qualifications for voting, with even stiffer qualifications for office holding, existed in all the colonies in 1775. The privileged upper classes, fearful of democratic excesses, were unwilling to grant the ballot to every biped of the forest. Perhaps half of the adult white males were thus disfranchised. But because of the ease of acquiring land and thus satisfying property requirements, the right to vote was not beyond the reach of most industrious and enterprising colonists. Yet somewhat surprisingly, eligible voters often did not exercise this precious privilege. They frequently acquiesced in the leadership of their betters, who ran colonial affairs though always reserving the right to vote misbehaving rascals out of office. By 1775 America was not yet a true democracy. Not socially, economically, or politically. But it was far more democratic than England and the European continent.
colonial institutions were giving freer rein to the democratic ideals of tolerance, educational advantages, equality of economic opportunity, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and representative government. And these democratic seeds, planted in the rich American soil, were about to bring forth a lush harvest in the years to come. Closing out our show for this evening is Becky McMurrin who reports on the colonial folkways and the impact of a simplified but satisfying life in the colonies on the eve of revolution. Everyday life in the colonies may now seem glamorous, especially as reflected in antique shops. But judged by modern standards, it was drab and tedious. For most people the labor was heavy and constant. Food was plentiful, though the diet could be coarse and monotonous. Americans probably ate more bountifully, especially of meat, than any people in the old world. Lazy or sickly was the person whose stomach was empty. Basic comforts now taken for granted were lacking. Churches were not heated at all, except for charcoal foot warmers that the women carried. During the frigid New England winters, the preaching of hellfire may not have seemed altogether unattractive. Drafty homes were poorly heated, chiefly by inefficient fireplaces. There was no running water in the houses, no plumbing, and probably not a single bathtub in all colonial America. Candles and whale oil lamps provided faint and flickering illumination. Garbage disposal was primitive. Long-snouted hogs customarily ranged the streets to consume refuse, while buzzards, protected by law, flapped greedily over tidbits of waste. Amusement was eagerly pursued where time and custom permitted. The militia assembled periodically for musters, which consisted of several days of drilling, liberally interspersed with merrymaking and flirting. On the frontier, pleasure was often combined with work at house raisings, quilting bees, husking bees, and apple parings. Funerals and weddings everywhere afforded opportunities for social gatherings, which customarily involved the swilling of much strong liquor. Winter sports were common in the north, whereas in the south card playing, horse racing, cockfighting, and fox hunting were favorite pastimes. George Washington, not surprisingly, was a superb rider. In the non-puritanical south, dancing was the rage, jigs, square dances, the Virginia reel and the agile Washington could swing his fair partner with the best of them. Other diversions beckoned. Lotteries were universally approved, even by the clergy, and were used to raise money for churches and colleges, including Harvard. Stage plays became popular in the South but were frowned upon in Quaker and Puritan colonies and in some places forbidden by law. Many of the New England clergy saw play-acting as time-consuming and immoral, they preferred religious lectures from which their flocks derived much spiritual satisfaction. Holidays were everywhere celebrated in the American colonies, but Christmas was frowned upon in New England as an offensive reminder of popery. Your tide is full tide was a common Puritan sneer. Thanksgiving Day came to be a truly American festival, for it combined thanks to God with an opportunity for jollification, gorging, and guzzling. By the mid-18th century, Britain's several North American colonies, despite their differences, revealed some striking similarities. All were basically English in language and customs, and Protestant in religion, while the widespread presence of other peoples and faiths compelled every colony to cede at least some degree of ethnic and religious toleration. Compared with contemporary Europe, they all afforded to enterprising individuals unusual opportunities for social mobility. They all possessed some measure of self-government though by no means complete democracy, communication and transportation among the colonies were improving. British North America by 1775 looked like a patchwork quilt, each part slightly different, but stitched together by common origins, common ways of life, and common beliefs in toleration, economic development, and, above all, self-rule. Faithfully, all the colonies were also separated from the seat of imperial authority by a vast ocean some 3,000 miles wide. These simple facts of shared history, culture, and geography set the stage for the colonists' struggle to unite as an independent people. For the History Tellers, I am Becky McMurrin. Thank you for watching this final segment of Colonial Society on the Eve of Revolution. Watch for our next series where the History Tellers investigate the duel for North America as war between France and England pull the world, and the Americas, into a devastating seven-year global war. Remember, history is not a lecture to be heard, but a story to be told. For the History Tellers, I'm Jason Calvert. Good night.